So I want to welcome everybody to this conversation. Thank you for showing up on an evening that's beautiful. Yeah. We haven't had so many of those, so that certainly is, shows your dedication to this. My name is Christy Carlson. I'm going to help facilitate this conversation as we talk about emergency planning and thinking about what our community can do. We're going to break the conversation up into three topic areas, as you've probably seen on the agenda. We're going to first hit sort of um, what's going on now. What are some actionable items? And then based on all the conversation, can everyone hear me okay? I know there's a fan back there, okay. Based on the conversation, as a team, we're gonna select probably our top few topics that we wanna bring for me to report out that again will lead to action. So I think I live in Montpelier, just so everyone knows that. I have a 12-year-old child who attends the seventh grade. I grew up in central Vermont my whole life. I was here for the 92 flood um, as a student at U32 do the math and then I'm now here um, you know witnessing what's happened to the community that I love so much and I know that there may be emotions when people talk about some of the destruction and that's a welcoming space for any feelings that people have about this but um, we are a smaller group but I think this is one of the most important topics it's what I'm very passionate about because it um, okay now we're gonna roast but um, <laughs> I miss the fan now, but it is a really important topic. So I think the first thing that would be helpful, oh, and I want to also introduce um, Maddie Murray Clausen. Hello. I'll be scribing to this evening, taking down your notes. Um, so thanks for having me. I grew up in Montpelier and live in Burlington, but I'm often here, so I'm very happy to be here. And her sister babysat my kid. So <laughs> as we all know, Montpelier is a, um, a strong community, and that's shown in all the work that folks have shown up. I'm also on the steering committee with, with Dan um, working on this effort. So one of the first things I think that's important to do is to ground the conversation in what is going on now. So before we move to what we want to see happen, maybe what, what didn't work well, I think it would be great to start the conversation around um, what is happening now with this topic in terms of I'm emergency. Confused. What, 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 what's happening now? Yeah, so for example, that would be to frame up, um, you know, I, during the storm, have signed up for emergency texts from the state. So as an example, something that's happening now that's a resource is when I was in Colchester and I had to drive home and the interstate was getting set to close, I saw that the interstate was getting set to close and I hightailed it from Colchester to make it home. So that's an example, maybe not as oh, relevant. Okay. I, 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 what you were talking about now, I thought meant today. I mean, but yeah, not like this very second. Right. Okay. <laughs> What's happening now is that the air has turned off yeah. and we're hot. Um, <laughs> but no, it's a broader conversation about what's happening. So that's one example probably not um, the main example. And while you're starting to think about that, and before we move to the next, which I think is where probably folks are the most excited to talk about, um, are the action items, I do wanna introduce Emily Harris. She is, um, uh, well, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. I don't need to. So I'm Emily Harris, I live up on Berlin Street, but I also work for Vermont Emergency Management. I'm the engagement section chief there, and so my section works with our local officials, our local emergency management directors, like, Bob, you're still the here, right? Yeah. And so every town has an emergency management director that coordinates emergency management in town. And so um, my section works with Bob, we provide training, we provide exercises where we practice how we're going to respond to emergencies, and we also do school safety just because so that's me. So again, Emily is here um, as a resource, so folks might have questions about what's currently happening. Um, not here to lead the conversation or dominate, but to add. But I think it might be interesting if you want to introduce yourself as well. Thank sure, you for of being course. here. Hi, I'm Robert Gowns. I'm the fire chief and the emergency management director for the city. Um, and I also uh, manage the health department. And um, I, I guess I'm here more just to listen and hear what people have to say. I was the um, incident commander in the emergency operations center the night of the flood. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I'd like to open it up to the floor. We're an intimate group. I think if everyone wants to sit together, they can. You can stay against the wall, too, if it's more comfortable. But um, does anyone want to start the conversation on what's happening now around this subject? <clears throat> OK, I'll start. Um, two weeks ago, I had dinner with my friend um, Roger Hill. 
you may know him as the uh, weather guy on DEV. He, he actually, his main business is forecasting uh, weather events uh, that so such a way that the utilities can pre-position their equipment for repairs. So he was telling me, gee, five days before this event uh, in July, it was evident that a major uh, storm was brewing, okay? Two days before, it was evident that this was about to be a catastrophic storm, okay? Um, he was kind of surprised that there was no major mobilization, uh, as was I, of resources, material, et cetera, that uh, happened in the case of this. Uh, so there was a level of failure on both the city and the state administration uh, in this because uh, we just all saw the pictures from California where they had a few days warning. You know, the people were out filling sandbags, the police were getting people in the home, there was actually some mobilization of effort. We didn't have that here, okay? So we lost hundreds of cars downtown that got flooded that couldn't, it didn't have to be. We had people uh, being forced to uh, move upstairs without knowing stuff, whereas if they had been warned that this was a probability early in the day on Monday, there could have been a lot of movement of stuff upstairs, there could have been a lot of... Uh, repositioning of stuff so that the uh, catas catastrophic destruction for a lot of our stores and a lot of our uh, people could have been avoided. Like I said, the cars could have gone to National right. Life, they could have gone up on the hill. Uh, but there were no police knocking on doors, there were no, uh, no notice, there was a notice on the phone, so if we all had the emergency response, but it didn't actually tell you anything to do. It was sort of like in Hawaii, they couldn't even get the management uh, thing to uh, work. So we were stuck in a situation where there was nobody doing that. Then finally the, the swift boats come in on Tuesday, you know, at, later in the night. They try and get people over to the traffic circle because, well, we're going to open the at junior high the, because uh, middle school because the roads are closed to Barry. So uh, somehow the idea of having an emergency response center in Montpelier was uh, un, uh, available in terms of the kind of imagining that the city did. This meant that we were now in a situation where people were just sort of left off. There was no uh, food, no water, no, uh, no place to sit, et cetera, at the uh, middle school. Okay, uh, so this was compounding a situation in which, you know, we didn't see anything from the state in terms of the National Guard showing up. We didn't see anything in mobilization of resources rapidly. It, it was sort of an empty uh, shell for all of us for quite a while. And um, it wasn't until you know the, the volunteers showed up at the hub a day later to try and help mobilize the cleanup crew that we uh, we start seeing something happening, and that was purely from the volunteer standpoint. So I was very disappointed personally in the city's response and the state's response to this, and it, it cried out to me that there needs to be some larger body that can oversee this kind of emergency response and rather than waiting for the kind of administrative incompetence that we uh, experience, that we can have a way of looking at this as a community, as a larger community, and say, what are we going to do in the future so that we know who's responsible for what? What are they doing? What is the list of who's going to be doing what where? Um, who's going to be mobilized when? How do we preposition stuff? All of this stuff, why isn't there an emergency um, shelter, if you will. So Dan, I just want to pause, because I want to make sure everyone has a chance. I know okay, you I'm sorry. Of, I'm, I'm, but that was a great tee up, right? I think we all, I saw a lot of nodding. I think what you're saying um, is, is familiar to folks, right, who lived in town. I just want to make sure, because I think you did a great tee up. Um, I'll, I, I will drop it now. No, but you did a great tee up, and I, you know, I want to pause in case other folks want to talk about sort of what's happening now, but maybe people are ready to move in, because I think you nicely transitioned to the gaps. And so I think the main goal of today is to think, of tonight, is to think about, like, I think we felt the gaps as residents. And so I think it's how do we come up with ideas? And you were pivoting to the ideas solution pretty well there, but just want to pause in case other people um, want to comment anything about the now. And if we're done with the now, we can just jump right into like what we should be doing. And I'll, I'm looking to you all, so yeah. I, I haven't read over any things that have come in um, yet of the ideas. So I was just listing out mine and I, I'd be really interested to hear a recap, like you said, of people that know, like since the flood, what's happening in this realm? What, what's our 
on the table, going to be done. So yeah, that's... Like I, just, yeah, I don't know if it's possible to just recap some of that. Like, what's in the works right now? So I think um, the main goal of today... So there's different besides areas. Besides this, I mean. Oh, besides this. I don't... Really? Chris, can I just about yeah. that? Do you want to? I, I don't have an answer, but I think it, given some of the expertise we have in the room, I think it's worth refreshing what we had in place as a municipality and some of the planning work that's taken place over the last 10 years that we may be able to build upon to address some of the gaps you very accurately uh, pointed out. So I'll. I think Bob's, Bob's probably in the best position. <laughs> I'm thinking of like a local emergency management plan. Yeah, or so housing. you know, the city has a very robust, a couple of very robust emergency management plans. They are available on the city's website. Um, and and, and a, a lot of it is around flooding. Um, some of the things you can find on the city's website are uh, the local hazard mitigation plan, which was updated in 2023. It was just updated, approved by the state. Uh, we worked with Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission to adopt that plan. We have a local emergency management plan that we update and uh, annually, and that gets approved by both Central Vermont Regional Planning and the state. Um, uh, you can also find the ri river hazard regulations, the floodplain regulations, the flood insurance rate zone maps, and there's maps on the city's website for um, the special flood hazard areas in the river corridor area. So all of that information is available. It is on the, and it's available for people to look at. And those are robust plans. The city's uh, hazard mitigation plan, is a, it's a 115 page plan. It goes into great details on, on all of these topics. Thank you. So there are lots of, there, there, there are a number of plans in place. In addition to that, I can continue if you like. It depends, is this helpful for folks? Mm -hmm. Yep. No. That, Yes, well, we're going to be respectful, Dan. So, continue. Um, Was that helpful, or do you want to hear more? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm okay. just wondering what happened to them, because it feels like things Yeah. 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 So, well, yeah. So, for, um, so, for people that don't use the internet very much, um, would it be a, a helpful thing to have a, a booklet on this? So one thing I think that would be great is so one of the so the goal of tonight, you know, and we have this here as a resource, and I think we all have emotions around what happened or not. The goal of tonight is as a community to come together and come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So one one area we could identify as a gap, and Maddie's taking notes, and I think it's one of the ones that we should hit, is how is and I heard it from Dan, and I heard it from you, and I heard also from other folks nodding. How is that information communicated to folks? So I think that's something that's actionable, right? So that's kind of the idea of where we want to land at the end of this. Right. Um, is so that's a great. So I think that's suggested um, on that was a book. Was a book for that. A book, yep. Yeah. yeah. Specific to Montpelier. So yeah. So for the next, let's sort of. I think we're already there. Listen, that is would yep. be a, a book's a great idea where, yep. where you can go to one. Water it is proof. available through Water the planning proof. office, but you have to look for it, and, and it's in different areas. So you know, having Make that all more in accessible. one, it's a great idea. Yeah, it is a great idea. So yeah. The, so now let's pivot to what are your ideas? What could or should have been done for recovery and resilience? We all lived through it. We obviously have ideas of what could have been better. We're gonna come up with a whole list of them and at the end as a group decide what are some three areas that we wanna have action items and what we can focus on to do. So I think we already have one of our first ones, but I wanna make sure everyone came here tonight because they have a view and something they wanna share. So I wanna make sure we pause and someone else goes now. I think having us available to help one another with adequate warning could have helped a lot. <clears throat> I went downtown on Monday morning after we, at Monday afternoon after we got the text saying, hey, this is going to be serious, which came out over the emergency alert system, I think around noon or 11. 11. And, you know, we were planning a grocery run. We called down to some shopkeepers in Montpelier and said, can we help you get stuff to higher ground? And we're told, well, I think we're mostly done with it. Well, they weren't. People were apparently given an idea of a flood level to expect, and the water came up higher. And they were probably taxed and overwhelmed. 
if we had a volunteer group organized ahead of time to get the book sale out of the library basement, inventory out of storefronts, there could have been a much easier cleanup. And I would have been a heck of a lot happier lifting clean, not sodden materials with the cold I had that month. So we could have done that. And so we could have had a plan. My neighborhood up off of Terrace Street was totally marooned. Right. We had a, fam a couple who were coming back from a medical appointment in Boston on their way to Burlington who ended up spending a night in a house where someone took them in. They couldn't get out, even through Middlesex. We have a lot of older residents. What would have happened if someone had been seriously injured or had a health emergency? It would be nice to know that and have a plan so you would know what to do for your neighbor if that came to pass. So I heard a couple of things there. I just want to repeat that um, stood out. One idea was some sort of pre-organization of a volunteer group that could be mobilized. I know volunteers were mobilized after it hit, but something before, like you said, moved the clean material. And then I um, want to dig in a little bit about your idea about adequate, adequate warning. So let's talk Please. a little bit about what does that look like? What does adequate warning, so I, obviously I know adequate warning means telling us before the storm hits, but let's talk specifically, so for, you know, folks get their information in lots of different ways. Well, so one, let's, let's brainstorm what we could propose for adequate warning. And one thing that, that strikes me as I think back on it is every time there's a major thunderstorm, we're warned about flash floods and flash flood risk. We get used to seeing this. This wasn't flash flood, this was a different beast. And knowing that that was in the offing earlier would have been. So let's talk a little bit about, like, specifically, you know, ideas, sirens, text alerts, phone calls, door to door. What what would be sort of helpful here? I think that I, I don't know what happened with the capital area neighborhoods, and I wasn't involved with it, so I'd love to know about that. Yeah. But do we have a siren or a horn or something? You do not. You do not. Obviously, that's that too. Okay, that's we, it. So, we've, had, we've had a bunch of Google, oh, some planning sessions with in my area where that, that exact suggestion has come up that a siren for, you know, we could also have a drought year and uh, with so much undergrowth, we could have fires. So, we need a, an emergency warning system that is um, very visible to people to know that we're safe. I would also like to put out that I'd rather be safe than sorry. You know, this goes along to your uh, thing about, well, we get these flash flood warnings, so, uh, you know, because it's hard when you're saying, okay, well, you've got to move your stuff up, you've got to move uh, out of here, et cetera, uh, because that's a, you know, like, oh my God, that's just more work. And this is, you know, we've got to start taking this seriously because climate change is real, okay? The climate crisis is real. This is going to keep happening because as long as there's hot, uh, weather in the West, it's going to be loading a lot of moisture into the atmosphere coming and, oh, look, these nice mountains here in the Adirondacks and the Greens, let's dump it here. So we're going to have this, you know, this has been one of the worst summers any of us can uh, remember, just with the, not, not even with the thing. So we've got to start saying, okay, I would rather have to move my car and move some stuff prior to uh, this, even if I have to, you know, it, it's this, you know, gets me discombobulated for uh, a day, rather than having to go through what I went through with friends of digging out their basement <laughs> and getting the stuff. I mean, this is awful. You know, it's, it's like, you know, watching, looking at all these cars on Elm Street and other things that are just drowned and not going to go anywhere. I mean, it was, a, it was, it was a failure. So, uh, just to go back to what you're saying, um, my understanding is that we have a 42% population who are in the elderly. Yes, we do. And so that's high. Um, and so I think we really need to think about something big for them as well. Uh, and also for me, the first thing that came to my mind were the homeless population and where were they? Mm -hmm. How were they hearing about this if they were? I'd be interested in knowing how the business, I think it was Splash, where I heard that she was able to move all of her stuff out of the shop. So I don't know where she heard that this was happening so that she could prepare for it and why were not other shopkeepers aware 
or didn't he didn't hear of that or didn't do it or and it's not to put blame it's just to understand how some can do it and some can't or or don't so and I hope that's the correct business because I think it would be interesting. I think she's and here tonight. She is. Yeah. She is here. Yeah, yeah actually, she's but... here. I'm sure she'd be willing to share that. Yeah, I think it'd be good to know how she heard about it and when did she hear about it. Mm. How much time did she need to do what she did? Mm. I would also love to pick up on the theme that you mentioned about the elderly. And, you know, when we think about notification, we've talked about like a siren or some kind of warning um, as, a, as an idea that reaches some folks, right? But um, do you have any ideas on what might be effective for reaching the elderly? Or does other, do other folks? But I think that's a really important. And then we can talk about the unhoused, which I think is another critical piece of the conversation. I don't want to monopolize. I mean, does that mean? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a, a long history in um, emergency management, and I was a Red Cross disaster volunteer for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of just insight, and it was it was really different being on the outside watching things happen this time. I wasn't you know part of the response; I was part of the affected. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple of thoughts, and and also um, my work is as an advocate for people with disabilities. So I have a lot of concerns around you know. Um, the population. So I assume, um, well, I'll stay focused. One of my thoughts about how to notify people and how to get the word out. Um, I know Montpelier Alive did like an amazing job having volunteers after the fact and um, being there and really helping the community. And I'm trying to think like maybe beforehand, maybe we're utilizing volunteers to go door to door. Um, that to off of your idea. Yeah, yeah. to go door to door. Um, because sometimes people aren't, you know, especially if you're concerned about um, the elderly population or even people with disabilities, they're not um, necessarily as um, up on, you know, the social media stuff or alerts or I couldn't get my mother to use a cell phone. So, you know, I mean, there's just those um, battles. So I think maybe having some kind of door to door, um, but that is something that needs to have, you know, some training and, and planning and not just something you just do in the spur of the moment. Um, and then I'm also thinking about um, individuals with disabilities and I know like, um, is it the Gary home? Mm -hmm. the, is that the residential care or is this the living? I'm sure, I believe those homes are supposed to have their own like disaster plans, emergency plans. So. And again, it just comes back to the warnings of like how how much do we know, when do we know it? And I might be mis misspeaking, but I first heard about the storm on Sunday. Um, but then when I was listening to, I think, the governor's press conference on Monday, he referenced, oh, we knew this was coming Friday. And I'm like, what? Like, I didn't hear that. So, you know, there's just kind of this, I, I don't know what was going on with communication, who, you know. Yeah, like uneven communication. Yeah, like when, you know, when we knew it was going to be really bad. Um, <laughs> so those are just a few of the thoughts. It was clear on Friday that it was coming. Yeah. When I'm, so you have a lot of expertise, so we're very lucky to have you in the room. Um, and I think it tees off of your idea, which is some sort of volunteer group that is pre-ready to go and has specialized training. Um, do you think that would be a good way to reach, like, how, I guess, my elderly or folks who might have other abilities? Um, well, and there's other disability agencies, too, like my age, you know, I work for Disability Rights Vermont, you know, yeah. and then you have Vermont Center for Independent Living, which yes. is right in Montpelier, who yep. was, you know, devastated by the flood, but um, just maybe utilizing those organizations who um, work Experts. with populations that are uh, maybe more vulnerable and you want to try to get the word out we might have ways to, to try to help with that as well. The other theme I heard was trying to focus on uh, reaching the unhoused population, and so would love to talk about that. And I know you uh, have a thought. I just want to mention um, our outreach workers uh, who are helping the homeless population. Uh, every time there's um, been a, a warning of a flood, um, they're on it. Um, as much as I can be. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, one person I know of, she works um, 
through the group at the Welcome Center with the Angeles. Mm -hmm. But um, she's an outreach person for this area, and um, they, she definitely tries to get the word to anyone who can go and warn people who are camping near the river mm -hmm. or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to mention that they're doing what they can, although I think that is a, a situation where they need some more outreach workers because of our, our general increase in people not having housing. So probably more of like a door to door. Sorry, yes. I mean, no, I, yeah. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, continue. You, I, I can't remember your name. I'm from Mary. Home. I, Mary from Homelessness Task Force. Yeah. So you had mentioned the can. Oh, and I really, I don't know much about this can. I, 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 I can speak to that if we like. Like. I don't know what happened to it, but I think that would be wonderful. As in what you're thinking, like, right. um, how well, did, can you just explain can to folks? was neighborhood groups. So there was a group. Each neighborhood had a, maybe you can explain better. I, 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 yeah, I, I actually had some experience with this. Okay. So the, um, Just so it, I, I want to make sure everyone's familiar with it. I'm yeah, it, it's Capital Area Neighborhoods. It yeah. was a set up in 09 uh, in response to the great financial uh, breakdown where people were worried about uh, seniors not having food or uh, mm -hmm. energy during the winter and that was, and so some neighborhoods responded uh, more than others. One of the problems was always maintaining a organizing leadership within that um, area because there was no actual coordination of it. There wasn't any kind of official system. It was more like uh, put together, there was a grant that helped put it together and then the grant went away. Um, we tried to get it going again three years ago uh, with uh, under sustainable Montpelier. The same problem was that there was no um, real budget or leadership, and that's one of the problems that is uh, required, is there has to be somebody, some yeah. people in and the that's neighborhood. that's what you were saying, like, we would want this to be, so pivoting, again, to like a, like, if we were to propose something like that, I'm hearing it would need some kind of sustainable funding, it some be, kind it, of professional support, leadership. Professional support. And yeah. professional yeah. training, because if you're yeah. sending someone to someone's home, or you're sending someone to someone's home by the river, you need to know how to approach people. That is, um, and, we, and we have the potential yeah. of other, you know, and this is where it's something I think we have to consider in this. There are other kinds of emergencies or potential. Okay, we've seen in Oregon and Washington all of a sudden these cool areas that had heat domes, you know, brutal for the uh, senior uh, population. Definitely, yeah. Same with fires, uh, etc. So we have to have a broader definition of what can be an emergency and what we, emergencies we have to respond to. And therefore, it's identifying people within the neighborhood who are willing to take on leadership, support them, train them, and then have them doing the uh, outreach within the community to get a core volunteer. So the idea is there's 25 neighborhoods, 26 neighborhoods, sort of, that you can define within Montpelier. Each of those needs you know, a, a person who's going to do that. And so we, we looked at this a while ago, but the idea that there needs to be actually a couple of uh, facilitators, you know, people who are uh, actually putting things together, doing the uh, copying, doing the training, et cetera. It's not something that just happens because people would like it uh, to show up. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we do have these neighborhoods, and you said 26, it would be good to know where people can go. Mm. And if they are divided by, if there are 26, can we identify maybe, I don't know, four or six of these places where people can go? Because you don't want everyone going to the same place, right? Because eventually that's going to it, it was up. It was more on the idea of being able to have people check in on their neighbors, are you okay, do right. you need anything, Ra rather than having facilities within the, it, it was more like, oh, you know, you're, you got no heat, come over here, you know, uh, oh, you've got no, you know, uh, oh, you're, you're cut off, like uh, talking about the, what happened up on uh, Terror mm -hmm. Street, etc. What was you the know. budget for you're talking about? What, what was a, a need of a budget for that group? What was that? I mean, it, 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 it was uh, somewhere around 50 or 60,000 per. What was it? What was it, the budget? That was back in 09. But I guess the question is, um, what was the money used what, for? What did it use for? Like, as we think about this as a sustainable thing, right? Because it sounds like this had successes and then wasn't sustainable. It's it, it sort of so a lot of what interest in the, that as well. That's a great question. Yeah, like, though, what was the actual funding? Like, did that go to fund a position? Did that fund training? What did the money 
to go for resources for it, food. It, it, it mostly went for resources and food, okay. from what I understand. It was done by Gwen Paul Smith in the planning department at the time, and so uh, that you know, it, it you know it was one of those things that required sort of leadership energy, and once that was removed, went. <laughs> Can I so, speak to that? Yeah. Just because, I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm covering this for the bridge, but I actually was a, a neighborhood coordinator for CAN, and um, at the time, that was recently right before it ended, and I think that the money was going to pay a coordinator. Right. And it couldn't have happened without that coordinator. She got everybody together for big meetings, yeah. she helped, like... So you there know, needs to be a budget supporting. for probably I, I would say two yeah. coordinators, but yeah, yeah, I think so. It wasn't it was it was really hard to be a volunteer without that and the program fell apart when I think it was a grant, like you said. It, it was a grant, but I wasn't here at the time. I was just it was reported to me on how it got together. And then we tried to revive it but without the coordinator position uh, three years ago. And yeah. it, you know, it, we have a we, I still have the list of who the leaders were that but half of them left down. I would love to hear from other people on that idea because it sounds like, you know, we could do it in lots of different ways. It could be broken up by neighborhood, so it's very hyper-local. Um, you know, any other thoughts people have as they're hearing about this? So I, I'm living on Loomis Street right now, and there's um, about 14 tenants in this little complex where I live. And so all of us checked in with it, all of everyone that was there checked in with each other. And we checked in with the elder that lived in alone in the front, and everyone made sure that everyone was okay. My neighbor, um, I asked her if I could sleep on her porch upstairs because I'm on the ground floor. And just in case we got that influx from the, the dam, you just never know. I don't want to wake up, put my arm out, and have water there. So, <laughs> so I slept up on her porch, and we were all checking in on each other. And so that was, uh, you know, like kind of an example like of said, that working. It, yeah, you, like you said, there could be different degree, different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be, you know. Maybe there can be different setups of it. So that's where I thought I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I might uh, just throw out there is that I, I, so I'm part of the Parks and Trees Department here, and uh, I'm one of the staff there, and I've been at the hub uh, since the flood because uh, we took over the staffing and have helped out with Montpelier Live there. Um, we mobilized our whole department to switch, and we haven't done park stuff in forever. <laughs> and um, that is an opportunity as well, to kind of connect to existing members of the city government and mobilize them in a different way. We did it. We switched to mobilizing volunteers, and that worked out. And I think if we had a known ahead of time that we could mobilize to connect with potentially can coordinators or get messaging, you know, get the leaflets out, something like that. We could definitely do it as a city. Um, so if, if uh, a department is connected to those emergency plans and known that they need to switch gears in, in a situation to be called out, I think we could do it. Well, I think we learned a lot from the hub. Yeah. As, as city staff, we learned a lot from the hub of what can, you know, what can happen. Yeah. So that's a great idea. So another one to build on is sort of repositioning. Maybe your, your first priority is no longer relevant right now, right? So then you repositioned. Um, I want to keep on this theme of notification and see what other ideas folks have. Because again, I think we found. Um, that, yeah, yeah, no, I just had a comment on notification. You know, I have kids in the school system here, uh, in my Clear Rock Street system. If there's a snowstorm, we all get a phone call. Mm -hmm. um, Looking at the flooding event, I think we could have something like a city map with zone A, B, C, and you get a call. If you're in zone A, move your car to higher ground, elevate your furniture where possible. If you're in zone C, D, etc. Of course, that's just dealing with the, the event we just came through. Dan called out the, 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 the uh, fire hazard and the idea of an all hazards alert and, and how we respond and get paired with an alarm and the personalized call from from our, our fire department saying, hey, this is the situation, this is the plan. It's not going to get to everyone. We won't get to the folks without the cell phones. Mm -hmm. But it's going to hopefully get to enough that if we watch out for our neighbors, we might be able to spread that word. Uh, and, and the police yeah. could be used. Yeah. And I'm sure, for example, in our in our hazard mitigation plan, there's language about cooling stations during hot weather. Well, how do we get that 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 news out to the elderly in, uh, in another another kind of event that could be deadly. 
you know, it's the most deadly kind of natural disaster we have in this country, it's heat wave. So, we're going to rob And during this event, our cooling centers, as far as I know, are City Hall and the library. <laughs> and both buildings have been closed. And, and the senior center. But the they're, they're, they're going to be broke out. Yeah, it's yeah. a really good point because the one thing we know for sure is that with climate change, these storms and events are going to increase in frequency exactly. and severity. So this isn't this isn't a once in a hundred year event, unfortunately. In fact, our entire library is our library is mostly not air conditioned. Mm -hmm. If you go in there on a hot day, the library staff working in the sweatshop conditions, mm -hmm. they have an air conditioned conference room. I think for notification, another thing to think about is, again, systems that are already in place. And um, I know one of the things that I helped with after the fact um, via the hub was doing some um, meals for uh, meals on wheels deliveries. So if you're thinking of that system ahead of time as a way to get information to vulnerable people about uh, events that might be coming up. Um, and, and throwing in also, too, when you're thinking about giving information out, or even if it's going to be any kind of written form of information, that it's going to be accessible to, mm -hmm. to everybody. Yeah, so think about translation services, think yeah. about and um, disabilities, and yeah. But um, the Meals on Wheels would be another good avenue of linking, you know, with volunteers who already go to. Um, of Hawaii area. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea because they're, they know the people and know their needs. Usually, they check in with them and say, "Hey, how are you doing?" When they deliver, that's really a good idea. I think one of the other things that um, I don't remember when the shelter at the school was set up. Do you remember? at the middle school that mm -hmm. became like a temporary until they could get up, um, be sent up to Barry. Yeah, I don't remember the exact time it was. On Monday, was it on Monday? Monday morning, probably around Monday morning. Monday morning. So it was as folks were getting evacuated out of the meadow. Yeah. But a, you know, just we make a note of an emergency uh, facility here in town rather than the idea of going to Barry. It's, you know, yeah. it seems like uh, just the, the issues that have been brought up about uh, the, various places you couldn't get to Barry for a long that's time true. so we, we need something that's more set up here in town than rather than saying oh, well the red cross is over there well uh why don't you go over there yeah, and 302 was and unfortunately the those probably would have been the churches or the high school well no that's where the middle middle school you could set up a uh you know place with cots food you know some food and water that just so if you had people showing up there at least and who has um who has good boats that do rescue people besides people just coming in from out of state and the crews? Like how many boats are available through the emergency system in another flood to, to get some elderly people out and take them to a place? Like, I'm, I'm just curious. Do you know Anyone exactly how many swift water teams we so, have? So I the don't, local. but that number would be statewide. Yeah, that would, right. That would be to here, and those boats were deployed statewide. The what? Sorry, so we were talking about the urban search and rescue teams, yeah. um, which we've got a bunch in the state, but the problem is that they're statewide, and so they're um, deployed all around the state when something happens, so they're down south, and they're down yeah. in Rutland. And we have floods all over the state. It'd be wonderful, I think, to have some boats in these communities that we are next to the river. I was in Irene, and I got my canoes ready, and it was really helpful. We rescued two people. Right. It really feels yeah, like we should have our own fleet or something. Yeah. <laughs> we should have our own fleet or something. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're at the river. We need a we need a couple boats to help yeah. some elderly people get out or get to or disabled or whoever that can't make it on their own. They can't drive the car because they got flooded. Did we? Do you know? I know you, the state brought in dozens and dozens of these experts. Did any have to come to Montpelier? Do you have any insight on what we did? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we brought tons of people from out of state in. Um, I'm just wondering if any had Montpelier and if you know. Bob, you said yes. We had a we had a um, swift water rescue team in yeah. Montpelier. We had two actually in Montpelier. Okay. And and they performed some rescues in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. 
but they were staged here in Montpelier, and one of them was staged here prior to flooding. Oh, it was. You so know? there is already some capacity. Yeah, the state has, you know. Oh, I see. They have that plan. And, okay. And Great. We had a swift water rescue team in Montpelier Sunday. I saw one here, and I'm not. I wasn't indicating it wasn't around. I yeah. just didn't know, like. When you have a flood, how long does it take to get them? And is there one like locally? There, there are teams located all around the state, and we try and like jigsaw where they're going to go based on where we think the impacts are going right. to be and where they can get to um, at various yeah. times during the disaster. So yeah. as people may know, like flooding started down south, and so it was getting the teams down there and moving them north ahead of the storm as we could release them from down south. We also brought in helicopters too for the places that the teams couldn't actually get into even with their boats. Did they feel like, I'm just curious, did you feel like you had enough? I mean, that's why we brought in folks from out of state. <laughs> so, I guess but I am hearing yeah. from a couple folks an interest in resourcing emergency planning and response. And I think this is a good one to add to the list because this has come up now. Boats, what does our own um, resiliency look like as a community? And, you know, this isn't the time to shoot it down because maybe there are reasons why that doesn't make sense, but it's certainly. Um, is something to think about, and I think so. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I was, I think one of the biggest messages we can give, and the important message, is notification. I think, you know, I'm, I was thinking the other, other than just the unhoused uh, uh, population, I was also thinking, what would have happened if the kids were in school and we weren't notified until Monday and they were in school. If I had a child in school, and I'm sure I'm not the only parent, I would be heading to school. And you don't want people going into town if that's where the flood is heading. So I think, you know, waiting until the last minute to notify people is really, it's not helpful. So definitely hearing from everybody more notification early, but would love, like we have several specific ideas around the notification. So I think we've identified that as a gap, but like, what does that, you know, we talked about, and we get a lot of no notifications for Libby Bond Steel and, and those are pretty responsive. That's a text alert. That's not gonna capture the unhoused. We talked about having maybe a trained group of volunteers with a paid, facility, a paid uh, leader who is trained. We talked about pivoting some of the uh, city leadership and to going to do this work in a way that's very trained and actionable. Um, like we've gotten more specifics. Uh, we talked about also um, the map and how is that like, but again, there is no one way to notify. So part of the brainstorming is all our different lived experiences we bring. So like, I would love to hear what else, what else should we be doing as a community for emergency? And we talked about the siren, for example, that was something. Yeah. How about the band that goes across the TV when you know, you're expecting, there's some kind of alert. So people who don't have a cell phone might be watching TV. And so that would be another. So I just, I'd be negligent if I didn't mention this. It sounds like people might be aware about Vermont Alert. So Vermont Alert is where you can sign up for whatever alerts you want. You can get a text, you can get a phone call on your landline, on your cell phone, you can get an email, however you want to receive it. Um, and then those alerts can come from your city. And I think the city actually issued about 18 alerts during this event out of residents, letting them know what was going on. What you're speaking to in particular, the banner across the TV, that's called the emergency alert system. And that has to be, uh, that can be issued in an immediate life safety issue where right now something is happening or about to happen. It can't be like a day in advance. Um, it's a federal requirement that we can't do it that far in advance. But it is certainly an option that we can issue emergency alert system messages um, out to the community who gets immediate life safety, like the dam is about to break. That is an emergency alert system message. And if people aren't signed up for Vermont alerts, I have the information here. So you can, um, because Emily's right, we put out, we started putting out VP alert messages on Sunday. Yeah, that was, those alerts, say, I work in Colchester, that alert saved me from being one of the folks stuck on the interstate because. Yeah. So we were, we were at messaging as early as Sunday. Yeah. yeah, I think that was very helpful. But again, yeah. More we can, yeah. More we can get on the yeah. even, even with radio, yeah. we, we don't have TV that spent Sunday listening to a Sox game on DVD. They're very community-minded. But there was no mention of the governor mm -hmm. having declared a state of emergency. No. 
And, you know, if we know, we might have just done it even differently, but we might have offered help to other people. So radio, especially local radio like DEV and at the point, we have like quite a few local radio resources. So yeah. maybe try to... As, oh, open, as, as many ways oh, as possible. Oh, you're getting hot here? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to sit over well. here? It's not as bad over here. We certainly don't need any more heat. No. <laughs> we'll just have an air purifier that I just turned off. So if people yeah. have... Sorry, but I want to make sure we didn't and distract. With Vermont Alert, I found out about it after a friend from Addison County was coming to visit me and told me I was under a boil water notice when, I, when he arrived. Yeah. I've been living in town for years and went in and asked John Odom how I would find out about boil water notice. And he said, oh, well, this is what you do. Could those just, that flyer could be slipped into the water bill once or twice a year so that everybody's reminded it's there. Also with the water system, I was amazed how many people in this event were worked up on Front Porch Forum about how to deal with the boil water notice. In reality, you ought to have water in your house. You should have clean water on hand. FEMA puts that out in all of their sure. guidelines. That information should be disseminated widely in print. Well, see, there's a whole other session on infrastructure going on because yeah. we have a failing water system. Yes. I'm I trying not I, to get into that. I know. Well, you were, yeah. I, it is Kudos a, to you. It is a <laughs> semi-routine event, and people in this town yeah. should know boiling water requires this, that, and the yeah. other, and you probably ought to have some bottled water because if that water had been contaminated, it wouldn't just have been bacteria. And I do virus. know that with the, those notices that Green Mountain Support Services um, actually developed a flyer, um, an accessible flyer around mm -hmm. the instructions on what it means when there's a boil water and this impact to it. That's just another mm -hmm. example of a resource for. Um, I want to go back to the so, can thing for a second. It's a great idea. I'm getting those yeah. out. Yeah, and, uh, I, want that, yeah I just want to pause one second. That's we can do. Yeah. Out. Is and that, we've done a couple of. Uh, it is a great idea. We've set up, I think, three times at town meeting voting. We've had a table set up mm -hmm. in the voting, mm -hmm. handing this this information out, but sending it out to water bill or something's a great idea. It, I I'll, agree. I'll, I'll take that back. And it, it, you know, especially we can do it in a way that partners with an entity and knows how to make it accessible. Yeah. To do, but, yeah. But I want to make sure I we had more thoughts came yeah. upon me, but I wanted to capture that one because that's again an that actionable, um, that works. a way to reach everybody. And with the other thing is, yeah, yeah, with the discussion about having the city's disaster management plan and booklet form, that would be a way to do a neighbor to neighbor connection. Mm -hmm. Part of it, yeah. To start the, set up start that the volunteer network. group. Because a lot of us don't know our neighbors. Where? I love the story of the, the apartment building where everybody looked after everybody. I've mm -hmm. lived in places like that. My neighborhood right now is not like that. And if we had more excuses to get together and say, okay, we five houses, we look after one another, we inform one another, and try to keep. And share contact information. I have contact information for all my neighbors, right? So, yeah. Um, and and so there's also the, now this wonderful uh, 2,000 name uh, volunteer list that they have, which uh, seems to me, uh, you know, could be a resource for helping identify people who would like to be part of a, uh, you know, more re uh, connecting, you know, that, that's why I think there's all sorts of areas where we want to help connect people, which goes to your issue about knowing your people in your neighborhood. This, mm -hmm. th this, this is a huge part of community safety. And uh, because we all, you know, we had so, you know, the problem with the emergency alert thing is, do you get it so often you say, oh, yeah, that again. Uh, and so how, how do we ramp up the uh, understanding, which is usually a person-to-person -person contact, that you got to do something here, you know, because these alerts don't actually give you that kind of uh, feedback after you've had so many of them. So, well, okay, it's just another alert. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you had, I just want to make sure I think you had a thought a few minutes well, ago. Well, I just was going to say um, when I was just first thinking about this, you know, you get television, internet, phone. If you don't have any of those three, then, then you got your neighbors, your friends, mm -hmm. who are, can come to your house and talk to you. So I really believe in that. And, and that's what you need. If, you know, if we get things knocked out, that's what you need. Mm -hmm. You need to just... Absolutely. You know. Yeah, that speaks to that idea. have a network. And sometimes it's not going to be like 
all planned out and all this training. You're just gonna go next door and knock on the door. Or someone with no training at all can put a flyer under every door within like mm -hmm. two hours. I'm yeah. On one block. Yep. Also, it's, how many? Oh, go ahead. No, no, you're. At, I was wondering how many neighborhood can coordinators? Weren't there like captains for the? the there were, at best, there were about 12 or 13 when Gwen was doing it that were actually really active. There was a, I remember this. There were like signs. I think someone in my house, in my neighborhood put in front of their house that that's what they right, were. Right, and I was like, I didn't know what that was. Right. Well, you know, on a, <laughs> no, my block, I remember this now. to have like a, I don't know, de facto captain who texts everyone. There's a text thread of people I don't even know, but I know they live in the block. And that's how I found out most of my stuff because I'm like strangely uh, not connected in certain ways. And, uh, you know, if that person could be approached to be a captain, I'm sure she would do it. And then, you know, just having, like, it be common practice to say, alert three of your friends and family. Or, alert mm -hmm. three people, mm -hmm. like, three others. Mm -hmm. And that's just, like, becomes a slogan. Mm -hmm. Our first part. Alert three people, you know. And then, you know, word of mouth spreads. And it feels like an actual thing someone can do. So when they're given that task, it feels like a task they can do, and they'll probably do it. Thank you. That's a good idea. Because yeah, then it speaks to the idea of, like, making it hyper local yeah so that you can actually like have an action item but also whoever you are then you can also tell your neighbor who might live i mean your non-neighbor your your friend who might live on terrace street or oh, that, yeah. somewhere else or in barry or whatever but then you know the, you, we all have that one friend it's probably dan who's like super <laughs> super connected and like is always telling us do this, do that. Dan, you, our action is you have to text the whole city. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, <laughs> I, 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 Everyone, give Dan your cell phone. Um, right, but like to empower those people who yes. are already doing that. To, to and have the other layers of reaching people is key who yeah. don't have cell phone access, who might have need information in a different way. I think is has to be front and center. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just building off of all of this. Was um, I think that uh, in in the thick of it, when you're trying to get things ready and materials ready. Uh, it would be nice to have those ready and available ahead of time. So in terms of communications that we can just send, the city can put it out, hand this flyer out to this street. Um, I think the specificity could also be really key. Um, the more general those alerts are, the more people get them, the less they take them seriously. But if we had sent a specific team to Elm Street and said, you guys need to get out of Elm right, Street, exactly. that would, they would have taken that much more seriously than a citywide alert. Um, so I think the specificity, specificity piece can be really interesting, um, especially to have maybe like designated zones of, of like you were mentioning, yeah. but designated hand acts to go with that of severity level. Um, no, you're right, like to geo-target. Yeah. Specific, right, because if we all get the alert, and if you live on a hill in Montpelier, you're probably like, well, I don't know if I need to do this, whereas if you're on Elm Street, you might be like, is this real or not? Um, Elm, Elm Street, Main Street, you know, the side streets there, they need it. Yeah, but that gets to your idea. The robocall, I mean, hearing Lydia's voice yeah. at 6 in the morning, well, it's no school. So but it's even like your other idea reactive. of like zones, too. Well, zones, yeah. Because then the zones could feed in to the other conversations we've had about getting to people differently, where it's geo-targeted, it's phones, it's emails, it's knocks, it's this, it's out, you know, because to get everyone, it's going to take a path, like a network. Um, I wanted to change topics yes. slightly, if that's okay. Of I mean, one, and just one thought for after the fact was, um, so I rent downtown, I live right on State Street, right on the bridge, so um, directly affected. Mm. Um, but as a renter, um, and we've heard this from a lot of renters in the area, like information after the fact it didn't exist. And I know we should expect that from our landlord or from the owners of the building, but they were so straight out with dealing with basements and the emergency that we weren't getting any information as tenants. So like when we actually stayed in Capitol Plaza the night of the flood um, and couldn't leave there till the water receded to kind of trudge all the way around to get to State Street. and didn't even know if we actually could really go in our building. Like, when there was nobody to really ask. And so it just, um, and I know that that, um, the, the, just the chaos that, you know, and just the, everything that was going on immediately after, it's like that hub of information. I know when doing the disaster work, one of the important things was having consistent, timely information available to people during a disaster so they knew what time an update was going to come, and I think the city did that a lot, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily specific to renters. I think we're like a whole nother, um, and I don't even know if I would, I guess you could put homeowners in there too, um, but it's just, 
like a homeowner, you you answer to yourself. You don't have a you know somebody who's inspecting your building or um, yeah. So and then there's questions like that. Like I just found out because I actually um, emailed the fire marshal because I'm like I see all these placards going up on the buildings. Oh, don't go in here. You know, if there's green, there's yellow. And then I think we saw a really bad color. And I'm like, okay, nothing has shown up on our door. I don't know what that means. Nobody can tell me. Like, my landlord's not telling me anything. So finally, I, you know, the fire uh, fire marshal said, we didn't inspect your building. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know if that I like that or not, but okay. <laughs> what so would have just, been, like, if, thinking about your experience and your neighbors, what what would have been some effective ways to get you that information? Um, just, and I don't know, again, because you're talking about landlords and owners or, you know, property managers and owners, so I don't know how you mm -hmm. have them do that. But just having some kind of immediate communication with your tenants, you know, like we're all on this, you know, it's the same thing. Like we have each other's phone numbers in the building, so we all communicate, but... You, you know, we're not getting information from the source that we need it from. So, you know, and you, I don't think you can make them be like, oh, within 24 hours, you have to give your tenants information. But, like, somebody should be giving, I mean, giving us information so that we know we're in safe, that it's safe to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, well, yeah, that, let's just that, go that. to One sec. Yeah, I, uh, I do think we have, like, one or two more minutes and then we need to sort of review the big topics and try to come to consensus on a couple that we really think need to be moved on. And I want to be clear on that, too. It doesn't mean that the other topics that were talked about are lost. It's all been um, written down, and it will be used as we move forward, but we want to try to come. But I do want to, like, if we can all do this in, like, two minutes, because this might take a little robust conversation and narrow this down. But As we talked about other types of events, such as fire and other emergencies, evacuation routes become important. Mm -hmm. And I'm a map person, so I looked for my evacuation route when I moved into my neighborhood. Does the city have evacuation plans? Uh, not, we have plans, but, um, you know, plans are difficult because it, 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 you can only go into so much detail because what are, you know, you have to, have to what are you planning for? Right. But I'm just thinking that right. when you when you check into a hotel, you've got a map on the back of the door right. telling you how to get out of that building. Yeah. Yep. And, and a map. lot of people are not going to be proactive or think well on their feet. I work with the general public. I've seen this. <laughs> All right. So evacuation plans yeah. is part of the emergency response. I know you have. Did you have one more quick thought? I. Do, I I can ask. I was just wondering who said something about this city had sent out 14 or 16 18. notices. Who has that information? 18. So that's, because I didn't hear, I didn't get, I didn't hear anything. So that placard in front of you, and again, people get information in different ways. Oh, you mean this? Yes. If yes. you sign up for that, you get it either way. I have this. Oh. oh. All right. Yeah. So maybe there's some I guess email. I was waiting from the city. I didn't hear from the city leaders. For quite a few Which we've covered, so we're going to have to transition. Dan, 30 seconds. Okay. As I tried to say before, I think okay. we need a full kind of, we'll call it citizen commission that looks at all of this stuff because there were so many failures. What I'm hearing from is we didn't get notification. There were nobody showing up for stuff. I think we need a bigger thing than this session mm -hmm. yes. to, to start looking at this and it's yes. not you know we've had lots of little things that have come out of this but I think we actually need something that is larger that is independent of the city of the state but would have some influence on what happens to both of them because I don't think we have any other mechanism that is uh, certified through tr official channels that's going to make any difference thank you and one well, last thought before we do have well, to while I mentioned about turn. Um, the outreach person mm -hmm. with the homeless and how she tries to notify everyone she knows that's homeless about things. Uh, I want to note that even though they may get notification, how would they leave where they are to get to safety? Mm -hmm. So that's like a transportation issue for them and mm -hmm. a connection issue that they might not have, like a citizen that's right in a village might have, but somebody that's in the woods or that's near town, right. they don't have that transportation. So, so a solution would be having whoever is the volunteer groups having ways to help folks get to a safe place. Like it's not enough to just be like, you're not safe here. Yeah. That doesn't really accomplish much. Yeah. All right, so let's quickly 
Um, Maddie, yeah. I've been taking notes. Um, I've heard a few themes emerge, but um, yeah. what would be really helpful is if we can kind of just listen to some of the themes and some of the broader topics that we talked about and think about what are the what are the ones, and I guess this conversation has been great because we actually moved towards solutions. I thought people would be like, the federal government has to do this. This, uh, this, this conversation was like, we have to do this. The city has to do this. Like, it's very local. So this was pretty gratifying. But what are our so top? I'll run through. I, I don't know, there are three main buckets that we talked about, and they're all interrelated. But the three main themes are accessibility of information and notification systems, so needing to make needing to make notification systems more robust, accessible by all folks in Montpelier. The second, and I'll, I'll dive into some more specifics there in a second, the second main theme is adequate warning and notice so people can help each other and can help businesses in town. And then the third is dedicating resources um, to building out either a volunteer network that has professional support, training, and financial backing. So that might look like reinvigorating or evolving CAN. Um, and so that's the third main bucket. But I also just wanted to highlight that one other theme that I heard little bits and pieces of that we didn't talk about explicitly was um, a lot of folks were talking about the need um, to practice and get in the habit of doing something. And that's something where maybe um, having a more dedicated volunteer base um, that has established procedures and communication plans and connection with neighbors and community can help with that. Um, so again, top main themes are accessibility of information and notification systems, adequate warning and notice so that folks can help each other and mobilize ahead of time and mobilize perhaps after. Um, and notify people better after events. And then again, dedicated resources um, for making the community more connected through a volunteer network that's ready to go. Um, and that is practicing um, emergency preparedness. So. Oh, well, that might be. That might be it. And, but underneath the three, we have more specifics in terms of like we talked about the siren, we Definitely. talked about you know the notification, so, the geo targeting. Mm -hmm. Like so, we also have that captured. Yep. I like the idea. Of, well, I should turn to you all. Like, yeah. I can talk about some of Yeah, more just and listen so, to see if it's capturing the conversation or not and what we've missed. So for accessibility of information and notification systems, we talked about um, mechanisms, so non-online resources that are specific to Montpelier plans, so talking about having more print resources available um, for emergency plans that Montpelier already has in place or is maybe going to develop in the future. Groups of volunteers who go door to door and visit folks in person, um, so identifying vulnerable populations that we visit uh, before emergency events. A siren, um, which could help um, broadcast notification for all different types of hazards, whether it be snow, extreme heat, flood, fire. Um, we also talked about encouraging folks to sign up for VT Alert and maybe more education around how to sign up for VT Alert and having that um, education be more frequent through flyers in your water bill. Uh, better coordination with local radio stations for folks who um, might not be online or have a cell phone. Um, and then again, just more frequent communication overall um, and practicing the emergency preparedness and making sure that those notification systems are in place and are ready to be activated if they need to be. And then would we capture in there, do you have this in a different bucket, the idea of the communicating through the water bill? Um, That's in that bucket. <coughs> okay. Okay. Good. Did that reach tenants? Mm -hmm. no. No. Yeah, no. So we'd have to think about that yep. from the accessibility standpoint. Yep. And that yeah, mailbox. Right. Or like you said, like are we under doors? Are we in mailboxes? Are we? Yep. There, there was no mention anywhere in here of, although there's supposedly a plan on paper, who's responsible? That's what I'm waiting for. Who, who in the city is supposed to be doing what, when, how? Mm -hmm. Okay, these are all nice, specific things that could be done, mm -hmm. but I don't. I haven't heard anywhere how this uh, supposed plan gets translated into the reality that we're living in. Well, I think that's what is happening now. So, yeah, I, I think we can all agree the, that yeah. The shelter situation at the middle school or something. If that's going to be a place, there is yeah. probably not that hard to like always have water and. Have some there, like at all times, they can pull out if there's an issue. I don't know. Let's add that. Yep. One last baby thought, and then again, think if there's anything we missed. Again, all everything that we talked about is captured. So if you're not hearing the immediate thing, but because oh, we should wrap. To mention that 
um, you know, to, uh, when you get a flood like this, of course, it's a real, it's the wake-up call. You saw all these people tonight coming in, you know, and um, before that, there, there becomes a sort of complacency, you know, and it's like people who live near a volcano. Oh, it's never going to happen, you know, I never did, and, you know, so, I, and I don't think it's all waiting for the state or the city, you know, everybody's got a responsibility to try to, you know, be informed, and even though it's difficult, so we can improve, but, you know, we all got to step up and realize that these things will happen. Well, I think that is a good place to end. I want to thank you all. This has been a very thoughtful conversation, and, um, Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.